we'll get started now. Uh, <clears throat> thank you all for c c coming. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome you all to the Nandanjit Khenka you know, lecture of the Center like for the Advanced Study of India at Penn. And our speaker this afternoon needs a little introduction. Uh, Dr. Uh, Rukmini Banerjee is the CEO of Pratham, and she will be speaking on the challenges of elementary education in India. Uh, 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 uh. Pratham, as many of you know, is India's largest education movement and uh, a very important reason why it has become so important is thanks to Rukmini's <laughs> sort of leadership. Uh, Rukmini trained as an economist uh, at Stephens and the Delhi School of Economics and then she went as a Rhodes Scholar to Oxford and after that uh, uh, she went to the University of Chicago, which I gather at that time still had a graduate school of education, which I think the business school has since, you know, swallowed up. Uh, uh, and her interest in primary education actually began there while doing her PhD, when she did her field work in the schools in the inner city in, in you know, Chicago. Uh, she went back to India and joined Pratham in 1996. The organization uh, started a year earlier in 1995, uh, looking at elementary education in the slums of like, Mumbai. Since then, uh, of course, it has been a sort of historic journey for you know, Pratham. And one of the things which I think uh, some of you who know, you know, Rukmini, uh, you know, what is sort of remarkable about her is first she has a re really deep sort of egalitarian sensibility and which is really the passion that drives her uh, in ensuring that all children should have a decent sort of education. And then she, uh, the other thing which she brings is a, a real openness to new ideas, to new people and new processes. This is exactly what like, led her to create this landmark report called ASAR, which is the annual status of education in India. Uh, and you know, what's remarkable is, despite the huge number of, of inputs in elementary education in India, there was virtually no, no like, measure of outcomes. And ASAR is a truly extraordinary effort. Every year, they test 650,000 odd students across the country. With, with a largely volunteer force of about 25,000 people. And it's really become the landmark by which we think of very large scale testing. Uh, and this sort of uh, ability to aid, to scale up, to think of working in low cost environments, working with the government, not against the government, these are some of the hallmarks of like Rukmini's work. And it's a great pleasure to have her. Welcome. Uh, thank you so much, Devesh. <clears throat> it's very intimidating to be firstly at a university like this. For some reason, which I have not completely understood, we are rarely invited to speak at universities in India. So to come here and then to be in a room like this is, uh, is uh, a huge honor. Um, and also to speak at a university when you're not uh, academic, I think has its, has its own challenges. Um, I know there are a lot of experts in this room and um, what I thought I would do is really put out both from um, work on the ground as well as work in the sky, uh, issues and questions that you know, are currently bothering us. And uh, I'm hoping that we'll have a good discussion. Uh, whatever I say can lay the ground and then we can have a good discussion uh, that can be helpful to us as we go along. So challenges of elementary education in India or anywhere else are many. Um, and so I'll only talk about sort of one slice through it all. Yesterday, I heard a lot of, uh, I was in Washington, D.C., and there was a report being released uh, by Brookings called The Millions Learning. 
And around that report, there was a lot of panels and discussions. And I noticed that there were, you know, I mean, I'm simplifying, but two types of discussions that happened. One which said the world is a very complicated place, and therefore, you know, many complex things need to be done before the world can change. And there was another lot which said, take a slice through it, see what you can do and move ahead. And it's very clear which side we belong to. It's not that we don't think that the world is a complicated place, but we are quite simple people. So it's a little hard for simple people to do complicated things, so hence you do simple things. And I think that that's kind of the spirit behind Pratham, both in terms of the work we do on the ground, as well as you know, whatever, we don't like to call it research, because research means there was a search and then you searched it again and came to something better. So whatever is the word for when you do it the first time and do a simple thing, that's what we do. So I thought, <clears throat> I've also been in various uh, forums where storytelling is okay. So I'm gonna start with a story, and I'm gonna end with a story. That way you're ensured that at least people are awake in the beginning and awake at the end. Uh, it's a story that I think will uh, illustrate some of the uh, opportunities and the challenges uh, that I think we uh, in India face, both within the government and outside. This uh, happened a few years ago. I got a phone call one day. <clears throat> and uh, at my age, you can kind of tell if the person is old or young at the other end. And it sounded like it was a young, youngish person. He was the head of a district in Bihar. Uh, Bihar is my home state, so I always take calls that come from Bihar. Uh, and uh, he had a, uh, you know, he, he had been told by somebody that maybe he should talk to us. And what he said was that, you know, I am uh, I'm in charge of a small district. Uh, the district is called Jahanabad. It has about eight or 900 schools, which is a small, smaller, uh, in the range of districts, it's a small district. And it's not a very high profile district either. Um, and uh, he said that, the, you know, I've been looking at our schools and I feel like I've done whatever I could. We give out a lot of entitlements. There are scholarships, there are, uh, you know, uniforms, there are cycles. Uh, we give all of these things. I've also been quite, quite tight in terms of making sure that anybody who's supposed to show up in school shows up. But no matter what we do, the attendance of children is still not going above 60 some percent. I mean, the highest attendance I seem to be able to achieve is 70 percent. And I'm perplexed because I feel there's nothing more that I can do or the system can do. And so we are stuck. So do you have any ideas about how to get out of this stuck? So as it turns out, if somebody young asks somebody older, is there something you can do? It's very rare that you will say no. <laughs> Uh, in India, you say, adat se majboor hai, you know, you feel you must offer some advice. And so, you know, <clears throat> I, I, I said, well, uh, at the core, I, I said this is our belief. There are many things wrong with the world, but I think there are some things, if you look at it, what is at the core of the problem and what is on the side. One of the core issues is the children in class are not really getting anything. And that leads to uh, disengagement by kids. And kids in rural schools can really vote with their feet. If you know, you're not interested, you can just walk out of the door and there's more interesting things to do outside. So kids are getting disengaged. If you're a teacher, no matter at what level, and your students are not enjoying themselves or not gaining, you get demotivated. And parents who are watching this whole thing become uh, disenchanted with this whole process of schooling because often they have not been to school themselves and they have high hopes about what is going to happen inside, but watching how the teachers are and how the kids are. So all around, things seem to be in a low level kind of a stuck situation. And if you ask me, the attendance, low attendance is a, is a you know, a indication that things are not quite gelling. Kids are usually not, uh, uh, very excited about getting a scholarship, not at the age of eight or nine or 10. Older kids, like the ones here, are. But younger kids, they're also not very excited about entitlements. Entitlements are usually targeted at parents. Uh, and so if the kids are not coming, then there is something that the kids are not getting. And so if you think about that, how can we do something in the classroom that makes uh, it uh, worthwhile for kids to come? And a simple thing because of the history of what we had been doing, I said if kids feel they are making progress in class, then they come. 
I mean, that's a very uh, common sense thing. And uh, because of the young man's uh, enthusiastic voice, I said, uh, I'm in Bihar very often. So in a couple of days, why don't we meet? We'll come to your district. So we went to his district actually two days later, because I was kind of curious to see whether this was just a random conversation or it led to anything. And when we arrived, he had some papers on his desk. And what he had done on his own was actually to take a look with his own team at about 10 or 20 schools in which they looked at what our kids in different grades actually able to do. And he came to the conclusion himself that part of the reason of why things were not working out was that there was a very low level uh, of you know, simple things like being able to read or do math even in fifth grade. So when we sat down, I, there was no reason for me to even invoke the Asad report or start. He had already kind of gone beyond the obvious explanations for why things were not working to really trying to look at what is the core of teaching and learning, and that was the problem. And uh, our discussion therefore started at what could we do to transform that. And his view was that you know, you've done work like this in many places, so how about you come train our teachers and turn everything around? To which I said, well, you know, you're a small district, but you have eight or 900 schools, which means you have at least three teachers in every school, and this is not a job for somebody from the outside to do. We have to think about how the system itself can turn itself around. So what were the ideas to do that? Now, for those of you who are familiar with India, you'll know that there is a layer above the schools within the government system called cluster coordinators, and each of them are responsible for about anywhere between 12, 15, depends. I mean, anything between uh, 12 and 20 schools. And these people were originally placed with an idea that they would be able to lead uh, work in the schools. But because I think we've been for the last at least 20 years or more in a phase in which we've been putting in inputs, doing construction, bringing in new people, they've kind of turned into data collectors and accounting people for whether the inputs are in place. So uh, over the years, they are the ones who actually have any dealings with the school, but the dealings tend to be of a checklist type, where you go in and you inspect and you bring back. So our suggestion was, how about, because these are the only people who actually have daily interaction with schools, and if they are not motivated to bring about whatever change we want, it's hard for individual schools to change. So the uh, decision was that we work with this lot, and even in a large district, they, you know, these are, at the, if, you, if you look at how many people there are, there were, in, I think, in that district, you know, less than 100 or 150 such people. So we started working right away, and I was also impressed with this uh, gentleman's zeal to say, if we've thought of a problem and we've, we are going to embark on a solution, then let's start tomorrow. And oh, tomorrow only because that day was the afternoon, so you couldn't start. I mean, literally, we didn't start tomorrow, but we started within a week. And all we bargained for was to say, give us about three weeks. We want to have an interaction with your cluster coordinators for a couple of days. And then we want them to be actually doing what we would like teachers to do. If these guys are able to do it and are convinced that what we are suggesting is the thing to do, then we'll go ahead. And if not, it'll have been a good adventure. And we can say goodbye and all retreat to our if you were in India, you'd say retreat back to the pavilion. That's what we, cricketers do when they get out. Right? Um, so uh, the first day, and I'm telling you the story in some detail because I think it's the, I think the devil is in the details. So the first day we sat down with these people and in a typical uh, Indian bureaucratic setup, they were all a little put out that some fellows had arrived from somewhere and they were being made to listen to these outsiders. And those of you who know Pratham will know that almost everybody in Pratham is under 25 other than me. And so then they were being talked to by some extremely young people who pretended to know or you know, seemed to know what they were talking about. So this all creates a little bit of a, you know, unease to begin with. And uh, what we said is, you know, we started going down a you know, couple of things. And I remember saying, tell me what attendance in your school, in an average school in your district, what would attendance be like? And they were bang on the dot because they'd been really focusing on attendance. And they said, on a bad day, 50%, on a good day, 70%. Okay. And then we said, what do you think kids in fifth, uh, fifth grade can read? And they said, well, there are some children who can't you know, because of various reasons. But about 70% of kids, you know, those who come to school, 
you know, do learn, and so the number is somewhere between 60 or 70 percent. So we let it be at that, and the, what we did immediately after that was to go to nearby schools and come back with the actual situation in those schools. And when we came back, each team that went to our school just put their number next to the attendance and the learning numbers. And the attendance numbers were exactly as per their predictions, and the learning numbers were way off. Way off meaning they were really far out. Uh, in many schools in third, fourth, and fifth grade, they could find less than 25% or 30% kids who could read. And I think that led to this first moment which said, I visit schools all the time, I thought I knew my kids, but clearly there's a big gap here which is, uh, you know, which has come out and that we need to do something about this. And the whole unease in the situation kind of uh, went in a different direction to say, okay, now what can be done? Because if you are in fifth grade and you're still struggling with very basic things, so where should we start and what should we do and so on and so forth. So next couple of days were spent on you know, figuring out what activities you'll do. And what we say is leave the whole school day as it is, but reserve like maybe an hour or two to work on some of these foundational things. It's very difficult when you turn everything upside down all at the same time. So turn a little bit upside down, you know, because you have, you have to do a little bit of uh, uh, changes. And let's see what, how far we get with this stuff, the activities or uh, the methods that we are saying in about two weeks' time. And, uh, you know, people started, we, we, there were two or three cluster coordinators in each school. Kids were uh, divided by the level at which they were. Uh, and it follows very easily from the assert tool, the way it is done. And I remember going to a school which was in the middle of rice fields on all sides. And there was one of these guys who was in his 50s, had been a teacher, and, uh, you know, thought of himself as a, you know, reasonably good professional. And I went to his class, this, the hour of the, uh, the, the hour and a half that was given for this was the last hour and a half of the day. Because the district administration felt that anyway after lunchtime everybody goes home. So you may as well use the hours that are sort of wasted anyway. So first thing this gentleman said to me, it's very puzzling. 10 days are over and there are things happening that I don't understand. So I said, what kinds of things? He said, there are more children in my class in this last hour of the day than in the morning. I don't understand why that is. There are kids who are not talking at all on the first day, and they're talking all the time. I don't know what that is. What is causing this change? So I jokingly said to him, why didn't you look around? And he actually looked around, and there was nothing around. There was just rice fields around and him and the kids. So I said, what do you think the reason could be? He said, that's what's puzzling me. I can't figure out what has brought about the change. And so very politely I said to him, do you think it could be you? And this was somebody who had been in the school system for a long time, was absolutely shocked and said, maybe you're right. <laughs> and this idea that you could actually be doing something that could bring about a big <laughs> fundamental change, and the fundamental change was kids wanted to come. This time was put aside for grades three, four, and five, and you had to fight hard to keep the first and second graders out. They were hanging in through the windows. They wanted to come and sit down. You know, they clearly could see that something was going on and they were being left out. Anyway, so the long and the short of it was that across the board, I mean, not every single person, but many people kind of went over this, this uh, I don't know what to call it, the curve or the, the line, which got them to believe, number one, there is a problem. It's a real problem. I can see it. I can feel it. And number two, this problem is not so complicated that I can't solve it. There are things that I'm doing, and the real thing was you just mixed up the kids instead of by grade and by level. You mixed them up by level, so you didn't worry about whether they were third or fourth or fifth grade kids. And what you did was you started from where they were rather than starting from where the grade curriculum was. The grade curriculum was far above them. And uh, you started from there. You did a bunch of simple activities that got them to start talking and engaging and participating. And you know, I'm making it sound simple. It's a little bit more uh, hard work than this. But in 15 days' time, almost everybody felt that they'd brought about a significant change in the way the kids were interacting with them. And parents had begun to talk, saying something weird is going on. The kids don't play in the afternoon. They run back to school. Strange. What's going on? You know, everybody was a little bit skeptical. 
And so really based on this, we took the next step of saying that if you think you're convinced, can you now work with the, your own schools? And then, you know, the story carried on. And I want to just show you what, uh, what um, where should I be looking here? Uh, so this is this is the the I mean in a very very uh, crude way when we started with these kids in grades three four and five about only about a little under twenty percent could actually read words simple words everyday words and as the school year went on there are of course you know, holidays and so on and so forth but if you look at the, the number of days that we had some instruction it was about eighty days. We found that a large number, it was a little under 70%, it was like a little bit more than 70% could read. Now, reading was just something that you measured. What was very uh, remarkable and which all the teachers talked about is that there was a lot of talk. The classroom became very noisy because everybody wanted to talk about what they had read, they had things to say, they could work in groups, all sorts of other things began to happen. This is just a simple, I think this was just a way in which uh, I want to just bring to you a kind of big problem, kind of straightforward solution. It didn't require any really extra resources at all. The district was quite, uh, uh, I would say, proactive. So for that one hour, if there were teachers in nearby schools that had more teachers, they would shift people around. They did a bunch of things with parents as well. But even if they hadn't done some of the extra things, it just took the people that they had in the system, reorganized them. There was a goal that we want everybody to read a simple story by the end of this period. And people were kind of, you know, organized around that goal, and that's how it went on. Now, if I move to a kind of a bigger picture behind, uh, behind all of this, and we take a look at what India has gone through in the last 10, I and mean, even to the extent this is 20, 25 years, very big changes that have happened. Uh, in terms of uh, you know, policies, we've got new laws, expenditure on education by the government has really gone up, and all of this has happened in the last you know, uh, couple of years, I mean the last uh, two decades or so. And just for the last 10 years, even if you look at absolutely the crude measures, number of schools, number of teachers, and the last one is a very interesting one, because even 10 years ago, uh, just go back, roughly in India, if you look at the 2011 census, you have about 25 million kids at each age. So age 10, you have 25 million, age 11, you have 25 practice, that's the number. So 10 years ago, only about half of the kids who could have gone to 8th grade were making it to them. And in a, in a 10 year period, it's like almost everybody who can get to 10th grade, I think to 8th grade is, is getting it. So 24 million are going now. There's probably about a million or a million and a half who are not there. It's a huge change. Partly it's fueled by the fact that we have a compulsory education law, which says everybody can make it to the eighth grade, can have eight years of schooling. This is a result of that. But I think it's also a you know a change in aspiration, change in provisioning, a change in many of the uh, things that you uh, uh, see, which are behind what is going. Now if you ask me, are all children in school in India? The answer is, as I say, you both yes and no. Enrollment levels are very high. For the age group 6 to 14, which is the compulsory uh, education, <coughs> almost everybody is in school. But I asked some kids one time, remember in a uh, sixth grade uh, uh, school, I said uh, uh, to them, well, what does enrollment mean? And I have the best definition of enrollment ever. One day said that enrollment means that our names are in school. <laughs> <laughs> and we are also in school sometimes. <laughs> so enrollment numbers are very high, and I think that's why we should, wear, as you reach these kind of high numbers, we should stop and keep our enrollment. So the enrollment means that everybody's names are right. The question is, has everybody arrived? And the answer for everybody arriving is in this map. You probably can't see the numbers, but green is you know, you're close to the enrollment levels, and red is you're far away. So in the far away, if you look at that middle belt, that's like 50, 60 percent, which means on any given day, half the kids who want to be there are there. The question is on the next day, is it the same half or different half? Because in terms of actually teaching, it makes a difference as to who is in the classroom. If it's the same 50 percent, it's in a way easier, because you know you have to be the other 50 percent some other way. But if there's a random in and out, that makes a teacher's job you know, a bit more difficult. So yes, kids are in school, and yes, Sometimes we're in school in some places, but 
going from under 20% to where above 20%. This data is from Asar and it's rural. So this doesn't take into account what is happening even in the smaller cities. This is all really rural areas. In the cities, the, the situation can be more pronounced uh, than we see here. And interestingly, a lot of, there's a lot of talk in India and everywhere else about private schools, but the variation that we see across states and across grades is quite interesting. I haven't had a chance to put it here, but even if you look at the northwest of India, it's got a lot of private school growth. Uh, why is that? Is the weather there to visit the private schools? It's not here. Uh, they don't have common governments there, but our common governments are very, you know. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so, you see, Punjab, for example, has not grown very, very fast. But Uttar Pradesh has gone from 20% to you know, well above 50% in this period. And you see in Uttar Pradesh growth for every grade in every district across the world. But there are differences. There are states in which there's big growth in primary school for private schooling, but everybody comes back to government school for middle school. In other places, you see the opposite. So there is, I mean, for those of you who are looking for a PhD topic, this private school enrollment and the causes and the trends behind it is not a straightforward story. And very few people in India, you know, it's such an ideological thing between private and government, that somehow people don't want to get deeper into the trends and patterns that follow. On the eastern side of India, uh, where private schooling is very low, in Assam we look at are you going to private coaching or tuition? And that is extremely high. So, you know, whether the organizational structures for school or coaching class, you, if you take the coaching or the tuition part of it into it, you see a pretty high private input, additional input into <coughs> schooling everywhere. So, some go to government school in the morning and private tuition in the afternoon. Or there's all kinds of combinations of how people are supplementing what they're making. And I think that also comes from the mindset that more is better. So, put your kids into school earlier and earlier because more schooling is going to get you further. You know, pump your kids with more schooling inputs. You know, I think these are all aspirations. They are coming from places where you feel like education is the way to go. And the more education you get, you know, in the same unit of time or space or whatever it is, will help. So, in the West Bengal, for example, you find that even in first grade, well about 60% kids go to some kind of tutor uh, in India. And I think that perhaps the really most interesting story in Indian education is not in the schools, but is in this whole, like in manufacturing, is in this whole unorganized, potentially dynamic sector that is unregulated, a un, completely unstudied, you know, that lies outside. Um, coming to the, the, the main thing that you know, we work on, and this is a slide that Molly here doesn't want to see, because she was looking apparently when I arrived here today. Yeah. Well, you can your hands up with <laughs> And uh, she informed me that she actually looked for a job in front of And uh, whoever it is, somebody very strict, who interviewed her made a test. And since she couldn't get to this test, she was not given the job. <laughs> negotiate 
just talk about it, discuss it, write stuff like this on your own. And hey, this is the other thing that it, it doesn't scare me, other than love. <laughs> <laughs> that this seems doable. I mean, if you just put your mind to it and you know focus on it, you should be able to take things to this. So we found it to be a very useful actually mobilization tool to be able to get people engaged on what does the first step of learning mean and how you can participate. It's not that difficult. You know, we're talking about a big problem, but it's not an insoluble problem. But the problem as it stands today is like this. And if I look at third grade kids, so this long story is as a second grader. If I look at third grade kids, it tells me that about 25% of kids who go to third grade have actually been able to go for second grade stuff. And as you go further down, you see even in eighth grade, there are 25% of kids, and these are both private and government school kids in rural areas who are still struggling with basic, simple reading. And again, by reading, it's a proxy for anything else that comes with it. This is just an easy way to look at it. So we have a big problem. This is what the problem looks like, a much more sophisticated way of getting more in depth about the problem. But as you see from our story from Yanabal, it's not a problem that can't be you know, solved. So if we move to kind of just thinking a little bit more about broader things, the Indian school system is structured very much like most other schools. Our basic structure is age, is age graded. I think most school systems in the world have some kind of age grade structure. Uh, I had a, uh, just an aside, I remember asking my father once, and my father was a very respected person because he got his PhD at the University of Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. 
unless things are in place, how do you expect for it? You know, you can't have enough teachers, you can't have enough textbooks, you know, unless you have all these inputs in place. So I call them that they're preoccupied with inputs. You know, waiting for all inputs to happen before, before really any big transformation of teaching learning can happen. Then I'm not saying people together, because I don't know how much time I have, but, but uh, yeah, you know, just to get the big picture out. Then there's a whole group of people that often our bureaucrats fall into this, especially if they're from IIT, so they have a techno, what do they call it? A techno managerial approach that, you know, if you only have biometrics, everybody will know. <laughs> <laughs> who came to where, who bring where, all of them. <laughs> there are others who believe the right incentives, give somebody another 500 rupees, and, you know, energy will be unleashed. So, yeah, I think there's truth to some of these, but there's a whole chunk between spider monitoring, better administration, and all of this is true. We have a very lax, new system doing what we want. So we could benefit from a number of these things. And, you know, come with no accountability, you know, because somebody doesn't come, nobody, you know, nobody cares, etc. So there's a whole chunk of people who see only if all of this could be tightened, the whole system would uh, start moving again. Another school, I mean, these are not completely, they're all, you know, this is moving to that whole complex system where nothing, you know, unless you uh, change all moving parts, nothing will move. You know, what about these teachers? You know, there are all sorts of stories in the press, in popular media, the teachers can't teach, they have, you know, they're doing all sorts of things, they don't show up. So there is, <coughs> not only that there is all these administrative issues, but even if you write, we have, you know, just like the first generation learners, we have first generation teachers. We never had whatever eight million teachers ever in this period. How to handle those eight million teachers? You know, everyone's struggling. And so this is a long-term institutional change. You know, get big loans from the World Bank, build teacher training institutions, 20 years back. Fair But until then, it's going to be interesting. Right? <laughs> so that's another school of thought. And then there's people like us who believe that take the place there is. Uh, use it to maximum opportunity, build some positive energy in the system, and then take the next step. That this whole development is not a big, you know, big bang. It happens with, you know, take an inch part of the car, take two inches part of the box, and move in that way, and occasionally you'll be thrown out, and occasionally you'll get more space, and this is the way to move. Uh, many of you may be familiar with uh, Dan Pritchett, uh, who's an economist at uh, Harvard, I guess. And the nice thing about that is that he has fantastic titles in his papers. If you read the title of the paper, if you're writing, you don't read the paper, but the title is at all. And one of his papers, I think, is a really good paper, so you should read it. Uh, you're still in graduate school, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, it says the negative consequences of an over ambitious curriculum. So, what this consequences of this over ambitious curriculum, not only that they are very old, they're learning levels today. But the pathway as these kids go through the system is very flat. So if you don't learn the foundational stuff in the beginning, the chances that in fifth grade somebody is going to teach you how to read letters is practically zero. So you can almost predict that by second or third grade, you can even almost see that it is that 20% in third grade to read who has a fighting chance to get to the end of the school. And then, you know, affordability issues will come and so that if you don't do something about that piece, then... So I'll just finish up by... Uh, if you have a long plane ride and you learn how to do animation, then that's right. <laughs> uh, so, today, uh, we are now in April. The new government, which is soon becoming not so new government, uh, is in the process of formulating a new education policy. And they were supposed to have released it in uh, December. And so presumably sometime this year, it will be announced. Uh, will it have a much bigger component of learning, regardless of what is the pathway that you need to get there, than before? Uh, and you know, I call it, is there really a plan change in education or is it 
perhaps those kinds of sources are high. The other, the other question that we have had all along is that does policy change actually include practice change? Or will a large scale practice change actually be the policy change? In some way, the right to education is practices all change and then the law changes. You already had 96% of children in school before you had a compulsory education law. And perhaps in other countries, too, this is the case that things become law. Sometimes things become law, but they're actually pretty much part of the reality. And so it's really for the last 10% that the law comes into play. So what is the relationship that we see here between policy and practice and which comes first? Or does all of this happen at the same time? Or at different pace for different people? What are the political imperatives for change? Now, the current government, who hasn't made any pronouncement really majorly about elementary education or school education, all the you know stuff that's been happening is on higher education. Why would what is to be the political shift? My own home state of Bihar is a very good example of why there's a lot of political backing behind uh, education, and I don't know if people have done a detailed analysis. Really worth studying what the last 10 years of Nitish Kumar have done for schooling, learning in India's agenda that will follow. But it's been a policy in which actually it's not an education policy, but it's a women policy. And thereby focusing in a very big way on girls and women in many different ways, including in terms of you know making uh, an enabling environment for girls to go to school. You see a huge change in girls' enrollment in school, girls continuing up to secondary. And uh, you know, the, in addition to that, you have female affirmative action for uh, women in uh, local elections. You have affirmative action for women at a very high level, 50% level for government employment. You have very strong support for women's microfinance and self-help groups. And you know, maybe these are not straight line causation, massive prohibitions just match all the other in Bihar. All of these are leading to a consistently higher female vote in subsidy or in each election. So is this, do you need a much bigger political strategy into which the education part fits to really have some big fundamental changes to want? Bihar is a good example, some of the new states, Delhi is a very interesting example. I'm throwing out all these crazy topics for some of to go Delhi is also, you know, uh, really putting They've doubled their education budget. The finance minister is the education minister. They're loudly proclaiming that education must change. Three years down the road, it's very interesting to see what led from their policy or uh, pronouncements to, to actual change. And then finally, this whole private action in India is also, I think, uh, you know, there is a lot beneath the surface that needs to be studied. Because there's clearly a lot of, by private, everybody just automatically assumes all kinds of things. I think parents are private right parents also. And parental ambition and parental strategies for what they're doing also accounts for a whole set of activities that are happening around the institutional system. Uh, that, uh, and in many ways, if you look closely at private school practices, they are way more conservative than what's happening in the government sector. So apart from the absolute top end, which have the comfort of being very innovative, your you know, mom and pop low-cost schools, are not innovative. In fact, they're exactly the opposite. They are more age grade and more curriculum oriented than even, you know, what we've been able to work with the government to do, I cannot imagine private schools allowing that kind of flexibility or experimentation. So, just to finish on, these are the questions we should discuss, but I thought I could finish with the story. And uh, the story goes like this, that Uttar Pradesh is one of our most problematic states uh, in terms of education. And we did the work in as well. But in UP, the picture that you saw in Bihar, UP is far worse. So in UP, so we work in many districts in UP, and if you look at third, fourth, and fifth grade kids, more than 85% of kids cannot be over. And this is after you know all the inputs that have gone in. Now, this story is from UP that we work with a lot of these schools. Within about 50, 60 days, kids are able to be. Now the question is what we do beyond that. Because in the schools, there's not much. 
access the world at large. Keeping in mind that you know we have some strengths, we know how to organize people, but we don't necessarily know how to teach uh, you know uh, higher level things. So in, a, in about 200 villages in Rupi, Karu gave me a running run. And I think uh, I will try to give you the writing that raises some interesting opportunities. So kids have been given tablets. Uh, and these tablets are about six, seven thousand rupee tablets, or about a hundred dollar tablets. And they come preloaded with stuff. And the stuff is lots of stuff. Whatever stuff is out there. It's, it's, it's often, you know, there's, there are videos there to show you NASA uh, uh, space, in space, how you eat a sandwich in space. And it, it's just amazing. You can look at it and think, how do you, um, what do you call it? Take a towel which is wet and they you know, what happens to water that comes out. There are like There are conversational images. So there was no attempt to make a curriculum. There was just a lot of visual material in the space. The more interesting part is that kids have been organized in neighborhood groups. So where what are kids you play? That's your group in your neighborhood. And the tablet is placed with the some adult, that is attached like a mom or an older brother or sister. So the tablet's there. And there's no instructions. So you take the tablet, and we thought that kids would use it a couple of times a week. We find the problem. This is UP where attendance in school is around 50, 55 percent. The attendance, so the kids mark their own attendance, in these groups is 80 to 90. Almost every kid is there every day. Not only are they there every day, we have some columns where we mark guests. When you bring your friends along, there's a large amount of friends coming to be with you. The Meticulously collected information that the kids do in the Secondly, we find that kids are, and you know, again, problems with measurement, because, you know, we are, you saw our measurement. It comes very, you know, one, two, three, four. Here, all kinds of things are happening that they find very difficult to measure. I was visiting one of these villages, and the kids said to me, you know, engage. So I said, yeah, you know, this is great. We'll show you a video that we have made. So there were English videos in the tablet, which were actually quite bad. If there were two kids saying, hello, I'm with you, you're, and they raised it. How are you? Shall we say, goodbye. This is a little conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and firstly, everyone in the middle is saying these things. So, you know, I'm not sure what you want to say. But secondly, the kids showed me videos that they had made of themselves, which were far better than the videos that were seen in the video. They had taken nice bed covers, hung it up at the back, worn really nice clothes, practiced this conversation so it wasn't as popular as it was in the video. And it actually, I mean, nobody got the top film. Remember, these were the same kids who could not read a word 50 days ago, who were now making movies. They had science experiments which are on the videos. There is a you know, well known uh, scientist called Adil Bhutta. He has wonderful short videos, that, you know, really short videos that you do with just. And one of these, uh, in one of the, in another group, uh, the kids said, uh, so I said, which one, what's your favorite subject? They said, fine. They said, you know, what's so nice about that? They said, we didn't do so. So what can you do? And they wanted to show me an experiment. And the experiment involved, I forget what it was. I'm not particularly science myself. But it had a leaf, it had a bowl, it had water, it had a magnet, and you know, something was not supposed to say. So they started showing it to me all the time. <laughs> and there was a lot of frustration because they were performing and wasn't going well. And there were moms and aunts who were standing in the back because this happened at home. And one of the moms, you know, she had her head covered and she just flipped it out and said, come on, let me do it. And she actually did the experiment. And she did it right. And she did exactly like how it's, you know. And then she was sort of shocked and she said, you know, I actually didn't know that I knew it. But I sit with the kids every day. And so I figured out that, you know, we're the kids who were the kids. <laughs>
Many will take uh, any, 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 any questions. Yes. You can press that uh, speaker there. Yeah. Can you speak? So I can do it. You just press it. Yes. My question is about the teacher motivation. So in, in the schools, particularly in the rural areas, about the, uh, in the government schools, what do you think really motivates teachers to be good teachers in the classrooms? Thank you. 
country anywhere. And outside of his house or that location, there will be hundreds of cycles. And sometimes we try to choose the mic because this is a very hot teacher. And we've done small studies to show that a very hot teacher, especially for science and math, in not in the primary, but in the uh, upper primary of can earn 31,000 rupees from these. So what I feel is that you know, there is a lot of in this analysis of who we should study and why who. We have these mindsets that say school is good, you know, student is bad, private is bad, government is bad, you know, whatever those are. And we need to get away and look at what is the catchment area. And from the little we've done, we see for primary school case, the catchment area is a village. But for high order case, it's a whole panchayat where people can get on a cycle and go <coughs> Then what can be more efficient ways with our current resources that we can deliver better? And I think this is a, I think, is there anybody here from the business school? I mean, I think this, these are the things that we really need to study to look at, you know, what would be the cost versus the quality versus the equity angles of the organization. The business schools don't study equity. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm amazed at your last statement that 100 million kids, which is 8% of the India's population, has no place to go. When is the government of India going to pass some legislation for compulsory high school? This.
one for a 14 year old, an 18 year old, and the ways to get it may not be just more of the same. You know, we've seen, I think as a, as a uh, small child, I mean, going to school is part of your childhood, and I mean, all of our memories of going to school are not to go to the religion and not to go to the Fred Mia and the way to play and all the socialization. But as you go higher, the capability of the institution to deliver it is not high. And we are not using perhaps other ways like optimize. I'm saying that they could become ideal. But in the meanwhile, I think we need to really optimize what is part of today. I need much more responsible. Mine, um, uh, 
almost no vowels in such lettering, which leads to actually lots of people being able to read it, engage with it, you're at that level. So I think we have not engaged with what kind of literate environment we are in and what kind of chaos. What would be a supporting environment? And I don't think that difficult thing to have a mindset which says that only can participate. And then we not talk things in the world. Going to your question, our rural programs are uh, much more broadly than the other ones. And especially Bombay being the oldest, we still run our own preschool centers. We run, you know, but in uh, and even in Bombay now we are partnering with the government preschool centers more than running our own. Uh, in the rural areas, we do two kinds of work. One is we will run what we call learning camps, which are you know, this uh, 40 days or 50 days of a camp more of improving learning like I described. But the reason we do that is we want the four methods of this to be transplanted into the government. So we are as big uh, uh, teams working with governments in that Jehadabad study as we do in running our own. And our idea would be that we shrink what we do independently. And we need to do the independently to just refine our model, come up with new things and other things. But integrate that as much as possible into whichever system. It could be the government system, it could be any other system that uh, you can know, use. Then? Yeah, then? Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. You. <laughs> uh, I've been working on this area for a long time. I call myself a researcher, a word that didn't seem to do very well at the beginning of your talk. <laughs> but, I, but, but I think, as everybody will recognize, your talk is filled with research and uh, put in a, a wonderful, in some cases, story like way. I have two questions here. Yes. in light of 
Yes. Uh, my question is regarding the National Achievement Survey conducted by NCRT, and given that NCRT is a national government body, uh, I'm just trying to understand how does that impact Assar's uh, result, and if it does, then how does Assar uh, plan to navigate or gain more recognition from the government? Yeah.
came some of that. Uh, they measured grade level uh, uh, competency. And if you look at the results, they tell you that, so in a way, the entire measurement is different. We measured the household. We measured all children. Uh, I think in a country where 50% of the kids are not going to government schools, and it is a law that you are responsible for all children, you can't with how you get to the other children. So I think there's been a healthy uh, friction between NCRT and us. And uh, just the day before I came, there was a meeting in NCRT, convened by the ministry, which we all agree with them, they say, you must come up with something common. <laughs> but I think that's such more importantly, I think not just in India, but I think in large parts of the world where reading is an issue, you've got to recognize that and have some measurement in place for that, because otherwise it's not helpful. Just by knowing that you've got a score of 45, it's not helpful. I need to know what to do to you know, improve that. And I think secondly, we need to also get away from grade level and have a whole range of, and I think NCRT getting uh, in the new education policy, there's all kinds of measurement that is being thought of. And I also think that we have to have in countries which have resource constraints, we have to have measurement that we need to actually be and measurement that we really understand. And you look at every measurement that happens, that kind of thing. It's fine to have one sophisticated measurement once a year, once every other year, for everyone. But if you want to have some evidence connected to reality, it's important that the measurement be. Thank you, Rukmini. Uh, we have a you know reception outside. Uh, I think you've heard her, and you can see why she's such an inspiring figure. Uh, she brings a very pragmatic optimism to what she does, and she reminds me that those who can do and those who can't teach. So some of us have to do that. Uh, uh, you know, about half a century ago, her father was here to do his PhD in English. I got this dissertation and I read it, and lo and behold, I could actually understand it, even though it was in the English department. Uh, there was no post-colonial thought. Uh, there was, yes, it was pre-colonial. It was a beautifully written you know, dissertation. So we have a copy of his dissertation. For you. So please join us outside, and and you can again talk to her there. Thank you all for being here.